Good morning. Good. Nehemiah, thank you. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 9 begins like this. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. I see none of you saw fit to wear sackcloth today. I didn't see anybody with earth on their heads as part of the preparation of their hair. There is something. I did put a little piece of sackcloth on your seats. This is, yeah, because this, this is a cultural expression that is so foreign to us. The guys were literally teasing me. Why don't you wear a burlap sack? Just cut a hole and just preach it. I said, it's hot enough in here as it is. I don't think I need a burlap sack to help make the points. <laughs> But we did, we did think, you know what, here's sackcloth, itchy, hot, uncomfortable. And I wanted to read that verse first before we even get started and talk a little bit about this. The reason I put this on your seats and to have something physical in your hands is because this is a visceral passage. This is a physical response. And yes, it's foreign to our culture. We don't go around wearing sackcloth and putting earth on our heads. The closest we get might be Ash Wednesday for Lent if you go to some of the Orthodox churches. Or if you go to a funeral, maybe you wear very stiff, dark clothing. But the point is it was physical. This is physical. And I want us to ask this question. I want you to keep this. Don't throw it out. Slip in your Bible. Keep it because at the end of this time in particular, we'll come back and ask the same question. What does true confession look like for you today? It's not this, but it is something. It is something. Why are these people responding like this? We must ask these questions. We must not read quickly over biblical words and just let them fly over our heads. Hold on a second. Sackcloth, fasting, and earth on their heads. Okay, what's been happening in the chapters before? We've been studying Nehemiah. They have come together. Nehemiah had a concern that brought him all the way from the serving the king of Persia out to Jerusalem to lead the rebuilding of the walls and provide security for their city, for their people. The temple has been re rebuilt. Now in chapter 8, which Pat preached through last week, they're not only restoring the walls, they're restoring worship. And the way they begin in restoring worship is by reading the word, by reading the law. And do you remember how they responded? They attended to it. They bowed their heads. They grieved. And the leader said, don't grieve. Rejoice. And then they began to obey. They obeyed. They observed a feast that had not been observed. The text said in the last chapter, they, Israel had not observed a feast like that ever their hearts were to obey. So this is the context in which we pick up in chapter 9. They have just finished this feast. It is the seventh month. The feast is done. And now, why are they responding this way? I think at least part of the answer is because they have read the word. They have read the law, and they're starting to come to grips with what does this mean? What does this mean for us? When we think of desolate, desperate, hopeless places and conditions, often we think of those in terms of, that's a God-forsaken place, don't we? You think of the, 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 somehow you were, you were crash land in a single, single pilot plane in the, in the middle of the Sahara, and you survive, but you get out, and you can see nothing but sand all around. That's a God-forsaken place. If you were to the crash at sea, your, your boat sank under you and you, you, you're on a log. I actually looked it up. It happened last week. Off the waters of Newfoundland, there was a fisher boat that went down. They were saved, but it was 48 hours. Can you imagine those 48 hours when you can't see anything but water? That's a desolate, desperate, God-forsaken place. Imagine World War I and the trench warfare and the combatants and you went on a charge, and you're out in the middle of that so-called no man's land for good reason. It was called no man's land. 
and you're wounded and you're left and there's no one. That's a God forsaken place. In each of these situations, imagine it. It's hard for us, but imagine it. We know we need help, don't we? But it's not just help we need. It's help when we have no right or claim to it. That is what is happening here to the people as they come into chapter 9. Why are they in sackcloth? Why is dirt on their heads? Why are they responding when they've heard the words of God? Because they recognize they need help, but they have no right or claim to it. It'd be like you're at that trench, you're, you're, you're that combatant out, and, and you get a glimmer of hope. Here comes a guy. He's got the red cross and the wrong uniform. Or you're at sea, and you see a boat in the distance, and it comes closer, and you realize, that's the guy that absolutely hates me because I wrecked his life. I mean, this is what I'm trying, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get at these the feeling that they must have had. So I want us to now pick back up and read with this in mind. This is why, at least to start, to start why they had sackcloth and earth on their heads and why they were grieving. Verse 2, the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law. There it is again read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. That's about three hours. So hope everybody's getting comfortable. We'll be here to about 1.30. I'm not joking. No, I'm just I'm joking. <laughs> they read for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped their God. On the stairs... Of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Bani, Sherebiah, Bani, and Kanani, and they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Hashabniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, Pethahiah, said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted all above all blessing and praise. Again, this is a visceral passage. It is physical. Do you see how often the word stood or stand is repeated? I took the liberty in the text when I put it on the, ch the charts. There's all kinds of underlines. It means that the words are repeated a lot. It's a wonderful thing, family, when you're reading scripture, please look for the repeated words and phrases. They usually indicate this is really important. Why did they stand? It was a physical response to what was happening. We typically stand when we sing. Sometimes we raise our hands. We use our voices. It's visceral. There's room for us to, when we're thinking of assembling, when we're thinking of confessing, when we're thinking of worshiping this great God, they stood. The Levites said, stand. I love that. We will have chances in this service to stand again. Not right now. And then, when they said, I want you to just see chap uh, chapter five, verse 5. These Levites, it says that they said, everything that follows, including this line at the bottom, everything that follows in this whole chapter are these guys saying these things. It's all started with quotes. So these are these men now speaking. It's very interesting. Could you remember from chapter 8 that it wasn't just the leader? It wasn't just Ezra. It wasn't just the equivalent of me at that time. It was the word being expressed in their group. I don't know how. 40, 50,000 were guessing, some odd. These men. But also in Ezra, you learn these men had other men around them. It's almost like not a hierarchy, but a way to spread. I can't imagine how 40, 50,000 would hear all these things. So just amazing what they're about to say. And before I go on to the next, the rest of the verses, what they are about to say is some of the most spectacular, condensed, concentrated summaries in all of scripture of the history 
of God's dealing with his people. They literally are going to cover in this chapter Genesis through Kings. Not in detail, obviously. It's a summary, right? That's, we, we, we look for, when I'm reading report, <laughs> I look for the executive summary, right? T tell me what's important to know and I need it quickly. Well, this is what's going to happen here. We're not going to wonder what confession and worship look like. They're going to show us. They spent a quarter of the day doing this. We're going to get it in a much more concentrated form. I promise you about half an hour, right? But it is amazing. It's a testimony of God's amazing grace to them, his covenant mercies. And that's what I've titled the message today, his covenant mercies. Okay, let's read on. What do they say? Verse 6, you are the Lord. You alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve all of them. And the host of heavens worships you. You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made with him the covenant to give to his offspring the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite, and the Girgashite. And you have kept your promise for you are righteous. This confession of theirs, this worship of theirs begins with what? Begins with who? You are the Lord. It's not self-centered. It doesn't start with them. It starts with him. You are the Lord. Okay, but Lord, help us penetrate our 21st century and dull minds when we hear these words. You are the Lord. Okay, let me help you. You've made heaven. The heaven of the heavens. I chat gpt how big, because I'm an executive summary guy, how big is the universe? Any guesses? 93 billion light years, the observable part. Okay, I don't even know how to com communicate how big that is. But that's only what can be seen with all the modern technology. It was amazing to me because I'm like, I'm looking at the chat GPT, and you go, if you've ever played with it, it spits out the answer. It kept going. Like, I'm just, I wanted an answer. Like, the 93 billion would have been great. It was like five paragraphs. And the reason is, is we don't know. It, the space is expanding. Okay, so when it says, you have made heaven the heaven of heavens. Okay, this is the Lord we're talking about. They're orienting themselves to a God that blows our minds. That's where confession and worship begin. Not with us wonderful and beautiful, but it doesn't end there. It goes on. He isn't just, this, this is Genesis, right? Go, go read Genesis. Read, read, it'll take you two and a half hours to read the whole, so it would fit in that three-hour block, the quarter of the day, right? You read how God created the heavens, but then it gets to about chapter 11, 12, I can't remember, Abraham, and all of a sudden, this amazing God who is Lord, he becomes very personal. He chooses a man. From where? Ur. Guess where Ur was? Babylon, where these people had come from, is very personal. And God makes a personal promise. It's his covenant. This is the first time we see that word in this passage. His covenant. It's a personal promise. The way that God describes his relationship with us, with his people, is almost always in covenantal terms. It's almost always in terms of a relational and a personal promise. And here's what I want to draw your attention to before we move on from this. The bigness of the heavens, that, that, the magnitude of that cosmological truth, pales in comparison to the magnitude of this theological one. Yeah, the heavens are big. God's covenant mercies to us, buckle your seatbelts. That's what we're talking about here. We must move on. Verse 9. And you saw the affliction of our fathers, so now we're getting into Exodus, in Egypt, and heard their cry at the Red Sea, and performed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they acted arrogantly against our fathers, 
And you made a name for yourself as it is to this day. And you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land. And you cast their pursuers into the depths as a stone into mighty waters. By a pillar of cloud, you led them in the day and by a pillar of fire in the night to light for them the way in which they should go. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them right rules and true laws, good statutes and commandments. And you made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them commandments and statutes and a law by Moses, your servant. You gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought water for them out of the rock for their thirst. And you told them to go in to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. There it is, language of promise and covenant, sworn. And do you see how often give is repeated? In this whole passage in chapter 9, give shows up 14 times. Maybe that's important. God is either gave or give in some form. And what is he giving? He's giving the Mosaic law. He's giving his word. But he's not just giving his word. He's giving them literal bread, literal water. This is the opposite of forsaken, though they felt that, and we'll come to that. Next verse is chapter, uh, 16. But, but, how did they respond to this? But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. I want to pause. They acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck. This is language we don't use today. Maybe if you've been in church and grew up in church and heard a lot of sermons, you've heard, yes, stiff-necked people. And you kind of know that must mean stubborn. Well, yes, it does. But I want to pause on this because that's an imagery that's repeated in this chapter. And think about what that means, especially in light of what we just read. God's wonders and his amazing goodness in giving them his word. He came down from heaven, spoke to them, gave them bread, the manna. Go read about it in Exodus. Water from a rock, miraculous. But they acted what? Presumptuously. They took advantage. They presumed upon grace. And they stiffened their neck. The first thing I thought of when I thought of it was like our, our dog before she passed. When we would take Nala for a walk, either we're pulling or she's pulling. One of us is pulling, but it was stiff-necked. There was rebellion involved in the process. Right? Or else when we were feeding our kids when they were toddlers and in their high seat. Maybe this is very real for some of us. You know, the mush peas come out or whatever other godforsaken baby food there is, right? And you put that up to their mouth and it's like this. Oh, no. I mean, this is an imagery, right? We can get this. We don't use the term stiff-necked, but we can get that. Okay, these are funny. Well, what we're talking about here is not funny. It's appalling. It's awful. It's grieving. How dare we? Stiffen our neck in light of this Lord of the heavens. You are God who comes from heaven and gives us his word and his provision. This is the way they respond. Apparently, they stiffen their neck and they did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck. There it is again, appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. Let's go back there. But you, I know what it says next. What should it say next? Foom, done with you guys. That's not what it says. It says, but you are a God ready to forgive. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and did not forsake them. Even when they had made for themselves a golden calf and said, this is your God who brought you up out of Egypt and had committed great blasphemies. If there is an understatement in this passage, that is it. 
You, in your great mercies, did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud to lead them in the way did not depart for them by day, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way by which they should go. You gave your good spirit, there it is again, giving, to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. This is only Exodus. This rehearsing, this confessing, this worshiping, this turning back to what has happened. But do you see, you're starting to see the picture form of what confession and worship look like. These Levites who were leading the people now in Nehemiah's time who had restored the wall, but now we're restoring worship and realized, oh, we need help and we have no right or claim because look at what our fathers have done. Look at what we have done, but look at who God is. Look at who he is. He does not forsake them. He stays present with them. Go read it in Exodus. A literal pillar of cloud and pillar of fire over them day and night, attending to every need. This is the way it ends in 21. Then we come to the high point, 22 through 25. And you gave them. We're so, so this gets into numbers. If you're following the, in the story of the scripture, this gets into numbers and goes all the way into Joshua. And you gave them kingdoms and peoples and allotted to them every corner. So they took possession of the land, Sihon, king of Heshbon, the land of Og, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children as the stars of heaven. There it is again. And you brought them into the land that you had told their fathers to enter and possess. So the descendants went in and possessed the land. And you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hand with their kings and the peoples of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they captured fortified cities. That speaks of shelter, safety, a rich land, fertility, and took possession of houses, their shelter, full of good things, cisterns already hewn. That's water. We don't use cisterns today but they had supply, vineyards, orchards, fruit trees, food in abundance. So they ate and were filled and became fat and delighted in your great goodness. When the scripture says they became fat, they do not mean grew morbidly obese as we think of today. They mean they were satisfied. They were sated. This was a high point. This is the climactic summary of the faithfulness of God who did not forsake them. And it just says, in your great goodness. It's a summary. In your great goodness. So here they are, and here's their condition. But what happens? We must go on. Judges through kings. And the next verse is 20 to the 26 and on. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them. Why? In order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. There it is again. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you and you heard them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before you and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they turned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. And many times, many times you delivered them according to your mercies. So we see here, and you see if you read Judges all the way through Kings, this cycle of disobedience 
and a warning. The warning is grace, family. When we get a warning, it is grace. If you're driving down a road and there is a bridge, but the bridge is out and the sign says bridge out, stop, turn back, that is grace. Warning is grace. Don't touch the stove. It's hot. That's grace. You proceed on that bridge or you touch the stove at your own peril. A warning is grace and they were warned to turn, but they didn't. So he gave them to their enemies. There was a cycle of this and it's awful. It's hard to read. Judges and Kings, all of these books, it's hard to read them. Who's saying these words? The Levites. And they're rehearsing. They're confessing. They're calling a spade a spade. You remember this? From Nehemiah chapter 1 and confession. They're calling themselves out and they're calling out the Lord's faithfulness. Continuing on, verse 29. And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments. So those, those phrases acted presumptuously bracket this. They did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which if a person does them, he shall live by them. So let me pause on that. Because again, it's easy for us, especially if you're familiar, familiar with Christianity, familiar with scripture, to just read over that. Oh, it just went to, Listen, they did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules. These are not throwaway words. Which if a person does them, he shall live by them. This is the text directly and in the, in the stream commenting to us how to think about God's law. This is how to think about it. It is not a to-do list. It is not legalistic and is also not impossible. Not in an absolute sense. We see they're going to need his spirit. And in fact, their history of unfaithfulness should tell us something, shouldn't it? And when we, if we're honest and we look at our own lives, it should tell us something, shouldn't it? But the point is, God's law, when he gave them his word, when they reread it for the first time, many of them, and they're grieving in response, it's because they're recognizing, oh, this is the sign. This is the warning. Obedience is a way to embrace life. It is not a way to earn life. God's calling them to obey, to embrace life, not to earn it. And it's dawning on them. Oh, so they continue on. Which if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Verse 30, many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets. Yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. How should the next verse go? What would we expect, looking away for a moment, after this, after all this? Boom, really? Are we still dealing? Is this still going anywhere? Unfathomably, yes, why? Nevertheless, nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. Why? For you are a gracious and merciful God. So the summary of this cycle from Judges through Kings, you see how this is such a beautiful, massive summary of scripture? The summary of the cycle is this. They were presumptuous. They stiffened their neck. They did not obey. But that's not all the story. What did God do? He did not forsake. He was gracious and he remained merciful. And that's the story. So again, who are saying these words? Levites, the people, as they're restoring worship, they're rehearsing who God is and who they are. And they're calling spades, spades. We must too, we must too. And they're recognizing the God that God with whom they have to do is a God of mercy. The number of times mercy, merciful, great mercies shows up in this passage. What is mercy? Mercy is this, help to one in need who has no right or claim to it. That's a very important part. 
It's not just a feeling. You don't have mercy on somebody if you feel bad for them. That's not mercy. Mercy is action. But it's also not just action because they deserve it. It's actually not mercy if it's, the, if it's deserving. It's mercy when it isn't. When there's no right, there's no claim. This is how God describes himself. Do you realize? This is how he describes himself most often in scripture. Mercy, merciful, with respect to God. Steadfast love, often translated uh, faithfulness. There's multiple translations because the Hebrew word and the Greek word, the Hebrew in particular, it cannot be captured one English word. This is how God describes it 260 times in scripture. God is merciful. God is merciful. He's gracious and merciful. Think about Exodus 34. The first time God shows himself to Moses, the Lord, the Lord, what? Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Merciful. Help to one in need who has no right or claim. That is God. That is the, that is the sum of their confession. So now it pivots. We have this massive reflection of all of God's history of dealing with them. And now in the next verse, they bring it to the present. Verse 32. And we have the signal because in the text it says, now, <laughs> that means now for them. Not now for us, now for them. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who keeps covenant, he keeps his personal promise, and steadfast love, let not all the hardship seem little to you that has come upon us upon our kings and our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, and all your people, since the time of the kings of Assyria until today. So that, just to help us, that's a reference to Assyria as a reference to the first exile. So they're referring to their present time. Now, the fact that when God ultimately handed them over to the peoples, but he did not make an end, that's a reference to the exile. They were removed forcibly and viciously from their land that had been promised to them. It was judgment, but it wasn't an end. So when they say, since Syria till now, they're referring to the first. The northern kingdom went to Syria. Then they went to Babylon. Now Persia's ruling them. So there's this suffering. They're still under the, under the thumb of these rulers. Verse 33, yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Now there, in a, in a phrase, is your summary of a summary. This is the most potent and concentrated, and it bookends the entirety of their confession. You have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. Verse 34, our kings, our princes, our priests, and our fathers have not kept your law or paid attention to your commandments and your warnings that you gave them. Again, these good, gracious warnings, even in their own kingdom. Amid your great goodness, do you remember? We just talked about verses 20 to 25, the high point of God's great goodness. Even in that great goodness that you gave them and in the large and rich land that you set before them, they did not serve you or turn from their wicked works. Behold, we are slaves this day in the land that you gave to our fathers to enjoy its fruit and its good gifts. What irony. Behold, we are slaves. And its rich yield goes to the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They rule over our bodies and over our livestock as they please. And we are in great distress. We need help. This is their confession. This is their worship. This is their reading of the law. We don't have to wonder what that is. When it started in chapter 9, we've got the whole picture of it now. And it's amazing. So how do they respond? Verse 38, and the last verse in the chapter. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed documents are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And when Peter picks up in chapter 10 next week, we're going to get a list of those names, and we're going to get some very specific ways in which they are renewing their commitment, their covenant, their part of the bargain, as it, as it were. But there's no bargain, family. <laughs> Isn't that obvious? 
in the confession, in the rehearsing of their history? Isn't it clear? Could they ever be faithful? Right-hearted, I'm sure. It's interesting, the contrast, because it's not quite explicitly called out, but it's implied, and it's implied very strongly. This is their response now. I mean, we just saw the response of all the people through all of, all of their history, including when they were at their best in the great goodness. We saw their response then, and now it's, we want to renew our covenant. Wonderful. What is God's response? Has it ever changed? No, not by a long shot. He initiated the covenant. He chose Abraham in the first place. He keeps his promises. He has kept his covenant. And he is a God when he describes himself to Moses and to this day, a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. He is a God who never changes. This is who he is. Just to recap, again, we saw them as we read the verses. You keep your promise, you're righteous, you're ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, mighty, awesome, keeping covenant, steadfast love. You have dealt faithfully. Does God need to renew his covenant with his people? Absolutely not. He is unchanged in his disposition towards them. So let me bring this to us today. He is unchanged in his disposition towards us. Hebrews describes God as the same yesterday, today, forever. This is the God with whom we have to do today. Let me ask us to try to summarize this. Why this confession and worship? Why did they do this? I think in summary, it was to remember. They did it as a means of remembering who God is, that first. Who they are, brutally honestly. You cannot read this passage and come away thinking, I've sugarcoated that a little bit. Did they? Were they too harsh? If you're not sure, read the stories. If you've never read them, can I encourage you to read them? I know it'll take a while. Read it. Genesis all the way to Kings. And tell me, is chapter 9 too harsh of a summary? They were rehearsing. They were remembering who God really is, who they actually are. 2 Chronicles 17 says this, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will do what? I will hear from heaven and I will forgive. And I think why this chapter, this ancient text, this whole story of Nehemiah and the story of restoration, why is it important for us? Is for the same reasons. Friends, we need to remember who God is. He is not who we think he is. He is not who we expect him to be. He's far greater than that. He's a God of steadfast love and faithfulness who does not forsake. When forsaking is fully warranted. I mean, the, the, the analogies and illustrations just utterly fail. I struggled so much uh, how to start at the beginning, and I ended up with that, uh, that pastiche of like, you know, at sea, lost, in the desert, lost, in, in the trench fort. <laughs> On the way here, I um, ran over, I mean, the squirrel was already dead, but I ran over it. And it was just like, oh, the Lord's just like, have you ever seen that? Like when you're on 270, on 270, like six lanes or whatever it is. And this squirrel's like, what are you doing out there, man? I think if we're honest, that's not a bad picture of our lives. Running around on a six-lane highway. And here I am barreling out. Just um, work with me here, because I know this is imaginary. But I think it'll help us get this. 
I'm barreling down that 270 highway and I see that squirrel. And I stop. Hold on, this guy has been pillaging my attic. I, there's no love lost between me and squirrels. There's a long history, family can tell you. At great risk to me, I stop to try to get him off the road. This only begins to get at it. The, 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 all the illustrations break down. They utterly break down. Because the reality is that we're not a squirrel running across the road. We're dead. It's over. We've been smashed. We don't have the ability. We don't have the ability to respond. So how is it that we're to live by his covenant mercies? He made this personal promise to his people that he has faithfully kept for all of time, for all of human history, steadfast love and faithfulness to do what? To provide for us, to forgive us who have no right or claim. How can this be? How is this even possible? If we are faithless, 2 Timothy says, he will remain faithful because he cannot disown himself. He cannot deny himself. Psalm 25 says, Remember your mercy, O Lord, for your step and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness. You know, the number of times I reference mercy, half of them are in the Psalms. Maybe that's because we're to rehearse it. Maybe that's what we're to remember who God is and who we are and what our need is and the fact that he is supplying it, not just physically, but spiritually. Both. He did not forsake them. Three times over in Nehemiah 9, chapter, verse 16, verse 19, verse 31, he did not forsake them. Why? How can this be? Because the God of heaven, who forever keeps covenant and steadfast love and mercies, ultimately gave not just his word, he gave his word made flesh. He gave us Jesus, his only son. John chapter 1 describes the word made flesh and dwelling among us, full of grace and truth. It's the same word, grace, steadfast love. They're the same words. And this Jesus who came, he walked into this very city that they were rebuilding the walls about. The same walls were there. The temple that they had rebuilt, Jesus walked in it. The unfaithful people were still milling about. Another generation. And here comes Jesus. Ready and able to obey, to embrace life and lead us. God did not forsake them. Do you know why? Because God did forsake him. Jesus went to the cross on our behalf. He took our sins in his body on the tree. That's what the scripture says. That is God keeping his promise. That is steadfast love and faithfulness. That is mercy. That is help to those who need it, who have no right or claim. And that, family, is us. If you can't come to this place where you can say wholeheartedly, full-throatedly, I have no right or claim, then the gospel is not for you. Until you can completely forsake your own efforts, squirrel running around the highway, struggling in the desert, lost at sea, what are you going to do? Save yourself? This is the point. The Lord over all, heaven of heavens, has seen fit to send his own son that he might have mercy on us Amen. who so need it. That's how this can be. That's how this can be. So, what does confession look like now? I want us to slow down. And this is hard. <laughs> it's hard because the way we do church tends to be, I read this recently, I didn't make it up. Heads on sticks means we spend a lot of time in the intellectual bit. We need to slow down. 
and feel this was visceral, this confession. There was a reason they had earth on their heads and it wasn't just because that's what we do when we confess. What does confession look like for you now? What does it look like for us now? It's not this, but it's not less. So I want us to pause. I want us to breathe. I want us to think. I want to invite you to close your eyes. And I want you to take some time to meditate. That means to think deeply about what we've been talking about. I want you to think deeply about how it applies to you. I want you to listen with the ears of your heart to the Holy Spirit, the good spirit, the spirit that God gives to us to reveal to us his words, his warnings, his grace. He's inviting you to respond. And the basis of his invitation is not you or anything you can do. The basis of his invitation is his character, his steadfast love and faithfulness, which is such a sound place to stand. That's not a highway running around anymore. That is safety. That is unassailable faithfulness. So I want to give us some room, and I'm going to stop speaking. And I want to keep your eyes closed, and I want you to think. Lord, what does it look like for me to respond to you now?